Good morning. We sure are blessed with some talented musicians. That was, that was great. <laughs> Y'all know how to get us going in the mornings. Good morning, I am Kelly Waters. I'm one of the children's directors here at Sharon, and I just wanna welcome you all to Sharon. Um, I see quite a few guests. It's wonderful to have you here. Um, it's great to have you online as well. If this is your first time visiting, we welcome you. We're excited to have you here. Um, on the pews, there's an attendance pad. If you're here in person, if you wouldn't mind giving us your information on the attendance pad just so we can um, know the who was here today. Um, if you're watching online, there's also a connect card on there if you wouldn't mind filling that online. Um, we're thrilled to have Reverend Jerry Temple back today. He was incredible last week. We have been blessed with some great fill-ins while Pastor Griff has been out. But we're also excited that Pastor Griff will be back next week. So we're looking for you, Griff. Be ready. Um, this week, tomorrow, we will have yoga in the gym at 530. Bring your mat. I think the cost is $5, but excited to get that going. Um, also, there was a trustees meeting scheduled for tomorrow. If you got a card about the trustees meeting, they are going to postpone that meeting for a week. They're uh, still waiting for a few pieces of information to get back that they thought would be here for tomorrow. That's not. And exciting, our back to school bash has been rescheduled. Yay! <laughs> Even though we're all back to school already. Um, it will be this Saturday from 12 until 2 at Reedville Elementary School. So everyone plan to come to our back to school bash. Invite all your friends. Tell everybody you know. We would love to have a big crowd. We're going to have ice cream. <clears throat> and games and let's see last but not least next Sunday we will have our backpack blessing so all of you kids and students and teachers bring your backpack so that we can bless them to know that just that you're prayed for and that even while you're at school that um, you have people here that love you and are praying for you and for your year and if I don't have anything else have I missed anything All right, now I invite you all to stand and join with me as we praise God this morning with our opening hymn, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. Now let us affirm our faith as we join together as we say the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, 
And now if we could have our ushers come forward to receive our tithes and our offerings. Lord Jesus Christ, we give these offerings to you. Bless them that they will be used to make disciples and make a difference in our church, our community, and throughout the world. In your holy name, amen. And now if I could have the kids come up front for children's time with Miss Amy. did did you fill any buckets this week I did. you did did you, do you know what I'm talking about when I say fill a bucket I know you do because you go to my school and I know you do because we talk about that at our school what does it mean to fill a bucket Sophie okay make someone feel good about something so now did y'all fill a bucket this week for somebody what did you do? Oh, you played with someone. Okay. What did you do? My mom did it. My so I had two times I filled a bucket. Both um, I had to go to my my um my my dog to my mommy and then my sister dog. Mhm. Mm Oh, well, that was nice. That was helping someone. You helped her clean. Okay, well, that was good. Well, I brought some things today that helped fill my bucket. What are these? Cards. Cards and letters. These are some different things that I've saved over the years. These are just a couple of them. I have a big box of them. But some of these are just some things that helped fill my bucket today. I had someone... A kid this week just took a piece of paper and she wrote on it 
I am so glad I'm in your class, I can't wait. And she drew a nice little smiley face picture. So that kind of filled my bucket that she was excited to be in my class. I also have a note here that I found at church when I came last week. A little message telling me that I had some prayer beads in here and that I was being prayed for getting started back to school. And I'm not going to go through and read them all, but you can see that there's, I had just a little note card, I had a piece of notebook paper. I see, that looks good. These, I have these little cards so that notes can be written anyway, can't they? And all of these things just made me feel good over the years. Well, today's lesson in the Bible comes from Ephesians 5, and it's about a letter that Paul wrote to his friends in church. Now, we know that Paul traveled a lot and that he started a church, and he would travel again, and then he would write a letter to some people in his old church just to give them some advice. Did you know that 13 books of the New Testament are letters written by Paul to churches that he met while he was on his journeys? Well, today I'm going to read you some advice that he um, wrote in Ephesians 5, verse 15. He says, So be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. Don't be drunk with wine, because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves and making music to, in, to the Lord in your hearts. And give thanks for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you think that was some good advice that he wrote? Would you do some of those things? Could you do more of those? Well, Paul wanted to make sure that they were doing the things that God wanted them to do and that they were following the teaching of Jesus. So if you could give some advice to somebody, who has some advice they might give somebody? What might you tell someone to do? Anybody have an idea? No? Y'all aren't going to help me out this morning? Fair. What would you? Read the Bible. That's a good advice to give someone. Sophie? Go to church. That's good advice. What else? Pray. Could you give them advice to clean their room? Yeah. Could you give them advice to help someone at home like they were doing? Yes. What else? Do your homework. I don't clean my playroom. You going to clean your playroom? You don't? <laughs> Maybe you and brother could help out and clean your playroom this week. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I want you to try to be a bucket filler today. Just like God fills us up, Paul fills us up with the letters he wrote. I want you to try to be a bucket filler this week. Because you know what? In those little bags that you got these suckers in, there's a piece of paper in there and a pen or pencil that you get in those little bags every week. I want you to write somebody a good note. I want you to give them some advice this week. And I want you to fold it up and I want you to hand it to somebody. It can be somebody at home, at school, or at church. Okay? I want you to fill their bucket. Got it? All right, let's say a little prayer. Dear Lord, we are thankful that your Holy Spirit inspired Paul to write these letters. Help us to read and follow his advice so that we may have a life pleasing to you. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, y'all can go back to your seat. I told somebody, I think I preached too long last Sunday, so I want you to know I did that for a reason. 
Now, Griff's sermons will not seem as long. <laughs> um, I hope you all are aware that you all have, you all have a, a great pastor. And Griff's, Griff's a good young man. Uh, I've been on the board of Ordain Ministry for about eight or nine years. And I would say out of those eight or nine years I've been on the board of Ordain Ministry, Griff is one of the sharpest candidates that have come before us. And so uh, he is a special person, and I worked with him for about 11 months at uh, Covenant, and he has a, a passion for ministry, a love of the Lord, and uh, I, I think he, he's going to have a great ministry here because when, when great people and a great pastor get together, usually good things happen, and so I just believe the good things. And also it's going to be kind of neat um, to, to watch Theo grow up. I know we still have uh, people from churches years ago will ask us about our children because they were just uh, little, little things when we were pastoring there. So it'll be neat watching the grow up. So I think it's, it's a good thing. Um, Amy, I pretty much read my entire scripture passage, so I don't see any sense in me reading it again. That's okay, Amy. <laughs> you know, some churches have scripture readers anyway. They, they read the passage. This uh, past Tuesday uh, with, with the tornadoes, we were all made aware that, that weather forecasters uh, use words um, like watch and advisory and, and warning. A watch means that conditions are, are what, favorable for, for bad weather, but it doesn't necessarily mean that, that bad weather is going to come. An advisory means that, that hazardous weather is, is likely, but it, it won't be dangerous. But a warning, that's different. A, a, a warning means that severe, life-threatening weather is either occurring or is imminent, and that a, a prompt, immediate response is imperative. Most severe weather warnings are, are followed by specific instructions that are aimed to, to help us navigate our way through bad weather so that we can avoid injury or, or loss of life. Often we are told to stay indoors, to seek shelter, to find a, a, a safe space, to stay away from windows and avoid outside walls. Warnings are given to help us navigate our way, find our way through terrible storms. In verse 16 of our scripture reading today, Paul warns the church at Ephesus that they are going through difficult times. Times where evil seems to be present everywhere in the society. And, and that they need to respond, that, that they need to act accordingly. I think Paul wants them, listen, be aware that, that you are living in a time of evil. Paul is, is sorry, go ahead. <laughs> He's already had enough. <laughs> Paul is not naive. He knows that evil is both seductive and destructive. Th that it has no redeeming value. That it is a, a toxic, invasive poison that has the capability of destroying an entire society. So in order to help the Christians at Ephesus navigate their way through this difficult time of evil, Paul gives them some specific advice on how to avoid the pitfalls, the dangers, the difficulties of evil. I would say that some of you here this morning have family members that you wish that they could have avoided the pitfalls and the dangers and difficulty of evil. I personally think 
that we are living in a time of evil, maybe unprecedented evil, where evil is visible, embraced, and encouraged. And if the church is not careful, we're going to find ourselves victim of that evil. Now, these instructions that Paul gives to a first century church is just not meant for a first century church. They're meant for any church who is living in a time of evil. And so I think these instructions that Paul is giving the Christians at Ephesus are also pertinent to us. These are things that we need to know and need to do so that we can navigate ourselves through this world and not be destroyed by it. So this morning, I, I do want to look at some instructions, some specific instructions that Paul gave to the church at Ephesus that also are relevant for us today. The first thing that, that Paul instructs the church at Ephesus to do in, in these times of evil is stay in the know. Not necessarily about other people or other things, but about yourself. Stay in the know about yourself. Paul, in that 15th verse, says, make sure you pay a close attention. Make sure you pay close attention to how you're living your life. Pay close attention to how you're living your life. That is, be mindful, be attentive to what things influence you, to what things motivate you, to what things consume you, to, to what is important for you. What are your priorities? What are your values? What are your core beliefs? How does your relationship with God impact your life? Paul knows that when it comes to living in a time of evil, we cannot afford to live carelessly. We have to stay on top of. We have to continuously be aware of the effect of the way that I am living, how is it affecting my life and those around me? In other words, sometimes we just need to look at ourselves and say, how is the way that I am living, how is it affecting me? And how is it affecting everybody around me? Because if we choose not to live carefully, but recklessly, we are a prime target for evil. Evil can easily take someone down if they're not paying attention to how they're living. Now, you and I are pretty good about paying attention to how everybody else is living, right? We're pretty good about paying attention to how everybody else is living. But we don't do such a great job of paying attention to how we are living. So the first advice that Paul gives to the church at Ephesus and to us is be in the know. Make sure you pay careful attention to how you're living your life. The second thing that's that Paul instructs us to do in times of evil is play it smart. Avoid acting and thinking like a fool. In the second part of verse 15, Paul says, live wisely and not like fools. Live wisely and not like fools. A fool is someone whose life is driven by their feelings. They, they set their own standards of right and wrong. 
that they view their approach to life as ideal, just right. That, that's why they're a person that hardly ever seeks any form of counseling, instructions, or guidance. Because they know it all. Now, a fool is not necessarily someone who's uneducated. Because more often than not, a fool is highly educated. That's why they, they think they're so wise. <laughs> Because they think education and, and wisdom are the same thing, and it's not. Probably the greatest flaw of a fool is their cockiness, their brash self confidence. A fool usually thinks a lot of themselves. They really do. In the Bible, a fool is also someone who chooses to live as if there is no God. It's not in the Bible. It's not that a fool doesn't believe in God. It's that they choose to live as if there is no God. The, the existence of God, one way or the other, has no bearing on their life. They have no expectations of God and no concern for God. Their only concern is living life the way they want to live it. And they would much rather brag, boast about their sins and, than repent of their sins. You ever been around a fool? They're always bragging for some reason and boasting about their sins. They never see the need to repent of their sins. This is why a fool is such an easy prey uh, for evil. <laughs> this is why it's easy for evil just to get them to do what evil wants them to do because they're already leaning in that direction, right? A fool is, is already leaning in the direction that evil is going. However, wisdom in, in the Bible is about understanding life from God's perspective and living accordingly. Understanding life from God's perspective and living accordingly. Wisdom in includes intellectual knowledge, but it's more than that. Because intellectual knowledge does not guarantee wisdom. This world is full of brilliant people who are very unwise when it comes to living and life, right? This, this world is full of brilliant people who are not very wise. They don't have a clue when it comes to life and living. Wisdom from the Bible is not something that's innate. It's not something we were born with. And wisdom is not something we can just acquire through more learning. In the Bible, wisdom is a gift that comes, that evolves out of our relationship with God. The more time we spend with God in prayer, in scripture study, in worship, in service, the more wise, the more skill we become at living. In the Bible, wisdom is more than just knowing. In the Bible, wisdom is also doing. Wisdom is about living life wisely and skillfully. I, I think probably the, the, the greatest difference between a fool and a wise person is that a fool always makes the same mistakes over and over again. That's what a fool does. A fool makes the same mistakes over and over again where a wise person always learns from their experiences in life. God always uses them to teach them something. 
some of the, the wisdom I have in living comes sometimes through my mistakes because God makes me wise through them. Evil cannot fool wisdom, but evil can fool a fool. Evil can have a heyday with a fool. That's why Paul tells us to live our time wisely and not foolishly. The, the third thing that Paul instructs us to do in, in these times of evil is to seize the day to act now, to make good use of our time. In verse 16, Paul says, redeem the time because the days are evil. Redeeming time means making the most of the moment. Now realize they're living in evil days. It's there, it's happening. So Paul is saying, make the most of the moment Take full advantages of the opportunities you have in front of you. Take full advantages of the opportunities that you have in front of you. For some reasons, Christians seemed to retreat, to draw back when darkness seems to be prevailing. I don't know why, but sometimes Christians seem to retreat when darkness seems to be prevailing. We have a tendency to focus more on the obstacles we face than the opportunities that await us. It seems as though we would much rather write this present generation off as hopeless instead of seeing them as an opportunity to share the life-giving power of Jesus Christ. We seem to forget that it's in times of darkness that light shines the brightest. Understand that? It is in times of darkness that light shines the brightest. And so if you think that we're living in evil times, maybe unprecedented in evil, this is a wonderful opportunity to, for us to shine. That's what Paul's saying. I, I personally believe that evil always runs its course with each generation because it has nothing of substance to offer. And that eventually people will discover and be, become delusional about evil. And they will reject the thinking of their day and begin to look for meaning and purpose and significance somewhere else. And there's where you and I come in. I'm always honored to find a person that is disillusioned about life and about the, where the world is going because I see them as a wonderful opportunity to share the saving grace of Jesus Christ with because those folks may be open more so than anybody else. I always like when a person comes and tells me they're at the bottom. I say, oh, that's a wonderful place to be. That's a wonderful place to be at the bottom because you're now ready to get help. If you're that high off the floor, you're not going to listen to me. But if you're at the bottom digging a hole, you ready to listen. Some of you may remember, and some of you my age a little older. The late 60s and the early 70s were, were a time of, of great social unrest. There was violence and looting in the street. Students were, were rioting against the war in Vietnam. African Americans were, were marching against against racial injustice. It, it was a, a great time of upheaval. Hallucinic drugs, free love, and hard rock music were the symbols of rebellion against society. 
But in the midst of all that chaos in the late 60s and early 70s, there were Christians throughout America who saw it as a wonderful opportunity to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And what, you know what evolved out of the late 60s and early 70s? It was called the Jesus Movement. One of the greatest spiritual revivals to ever take place among young people. In the midst of all that was going on, all the social unrest, Jesus, Jesus people were coming into existence. A number of the people who came into the ministry when I did were products of the Jesus movement. My Christianity, 1969, right in the middle of it. So Paul is saying, listen. I, I know you're living in a time of evil, but this is also a wonderful time to share the gospel of Jesus Christ because I want you to know that these people in the world today who are on TV and everywhere making all this noise, they have nothing of substance to offer. And at some point, the people are going to become disillusional and going to reject the thinking of this day. And they're going to turn and look somewhere else for meaning and purpose and significance, and we need to be there. We need to be there, taking opportunity to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. The fourth thing, the fourth instruction that, that Paul gives the church in these time of evil is keep your eye on the ball. Stay the course. Stay focused on God's will. Do what God wants. And don't be a fool and get distracted by what the world is saying and doing. Stay the course. Keep your focus on God's will, what God is doing. And don't become a fool. And listen. Be distracted by what the world is saying and doing. The will of God basically comes down to two things. What God wants for us and what God wants from us. What does God want for us? God wants you and me to experience his amazing, redeeming love in Jesus Christ. That's what he wants for us. He wants us to experience his amazing, redeeming love in Jesus Christ. He wants us to come to know the unlimited power of the Holy Spirit that is available to us. He wants us to come to know the unlimited power of the Holy Spirit that is available to us. And he wants us to find the joy that comes from living in his presence. I hope you know that joy. The joy that comes from living in the presence of God. What does God want from us? God wants us to obey him out of love. Not out of duty, not out of necessity. God wants us to obey him out of love. God wants us to obey him not because we have to. God wants us to obey him because we want to. There's a big difference there. There's a huge difference there. Secondly, God wants us to be obedient out of trust. Not out of uncertainty and disbelief. But be obedient to him out of trust. If I obey God... I know God will take care of me. And God wants us to be obedient out of hum humility, not out of arrogance and not out of pride. God, I, I know that, that you are the creator and I am the creation. I know that, that you are the, the master and I know that I am the servant. I know that, that your word is first, not mine. C.S. Lewis says that obedience, obedience to God 
is the road to freedom. That you and I find liberty and freedom in, in obeying God's will. Because when we're living a life of obedience, we become free from the restrictions that this world tries to put on us. You see, one way to, to quit being a slave to the world and the chains it puts around your neck is by being obedient to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I personally believe that obedience to God's will is the one thing that Satan fears the most. I don't think us reading the Bible fears him. I don't think us studying the scripture fears him. I, I, I don't think going to church fears him or doing service work fears him. What fears him is a prayer, a person who prays, a person who studies God's word, a person who worships, a person who serves and is obedient to God. Evil can find no room in someone's heart that is obedient to God. So Paul says to them, keep your eye on the ball. Stay the course. Stay focused on what God's will is, what God wants. And don't be foolish and let yourself be distracted by what the world is saying and doing. They told me I got to pray this Sunday. I forgot to pray last Sunday. <laughs> the next thing that Paul instructs the church to do in, in evil times is be filled with the right stuff, not the wrong stuff. The stuff that gives us life, not the stuff that destroys us. Listen to verse 18. Paul says, don't get drunk on wine or don't get drunk on any form of alcohol because there's always the danger of excessive drinking. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Now, Paul knows that if a person is prone to excessive drinking, that their life is going to be filled with a, a mind-altering drug because alcohol is a drug. It's a mind-altering drug. And he knows that, that the effect of this drug will be on the way we think, the way we act, and the way we feel. The, the, the more intoxicated a person is, the more alcohol will impact their life, right? The more intoxicated a person is, the more alcohol will impact their life. Th this is why the chronic consumption of alcohol is filling yourself with the wrong stuff. Sometimes you need to pay close attention to what you're filling yourself with. Somebody says that what fills us controls us. If we're filled with anger, what controls us? Anger. If we're filled with fear, what controls us? If we're filled with love, what controls us? Love. Be careful what stuff you fill your life with. Be careful. Be careful. I, I like it. And Paul says, listen, guys, I, I, I got a, a, I got a better alternative. I've got a better option. Instead of, of, of being under the effects, the influence, and the control of a mind-altering drug, how about choose to be under the effects, the influence, and the control of God's Spirit? How about that? Instead of filling your body, your mind, your soul with things, that, with stuff that's going to destroy you, how about fill it with something that's going to give your soul life, your soul life. Someone said to me, what does it mean to be 
filled with the Holy Spirit? Well, first of all, it doesn't mean to get something you don't have. Because when you and I become a Christian, when we accept Christ as our Savior, we receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is there. Also, it doesn't mean to get more of what you do have. The Holy Spirit is a person. We don't get the Holy Spirit on installments. When, when we accept Christ as our Savior, the person of the Holy Spirit comes into our life. We've got all the Holy Spirit. You can't divide a person up. Not legally. And being filled with the Spirit is not a one-time thing. It's not a one-time event. Paul uses the present tense here. That means he's saying, be continually filled with the Holy Spirit. You know why I need to be continually filled with the Holy Spirit? I leak. I leak. You know what I think heaven is? When I get to heaven, I will be filled with the Spirit of God and I won't leak anymore. Oh, I'm waiting on that day when I don't leak anymore. So a, a good way of saying what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit it doesn't mean getting more of the Holy Spirit. It means the Holy Spirit getting more of you. Okay? It means the Holy Spirit getting more of you. The Holy Spirit having more influence and more control in your life. Someone asked me one time, Jerry, how, how can I stay filled with the Holy Spirit? I says, daily have a healthy appetite for spiritual things. Not, not when you're up against a wall, but daily have a spiritual appetite and always make sure that you want your life each day to be centered in Christ, to be centered in Christ. If you have a healthy, healthy appetite for spiritual things and keep your life centered in Christ, you will continually fill yourself with the Holy Spirit. And that's the right stuff. Some of us this morning, we have filled our lives with the wrong stuff. Evil can do a lot of damage when we fill ourselves with the wrong stuff. Evil can't lay a hand on us when we fill ourselves with the, the right stuff. And finally, and I, and I like this last part here. Jesus says, Keep on singing. I mean, Paul says, keep on singing. Let your voices be heard in the sanctuary because singing matters. Notice this, that Paul's command to sing is preceded by Paul's command to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I find that people who are filled with the Holy Spirit love and want to sing. You can't shut them up. They want to sing. A couple weeks ago, I, I read what I considered a, a disturbing article because of the author of this article was saying that statistics are showing us that congregational singing in the church is declining. That fewer people are singing the songs. People are standing, but they're not singing. Sometimes it, we want to blame, maybe it's the songs we're singing. I'm filled with the Holy Spirit, and I'll give a tenth at anything. If he's talking about Jesus and talking about the, the amazing love of God, I'm going to get in there and fight it because I'm going to sing it. I, I want you to notice here in, in this verse, let, let, me, let me read it to you. Encourage each other with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord. Notice the diversity of songs that Paul mentioned here. He didn't say only sing hymns in this church. He didn't say only sing contemporary music in this church. 
He said, sing psalms. The psalms is the 150 psalms that are, that are in the Old Testament. The early church was taking them and, and putting them to, to music and singing them. He said, sing hymns. Hymns are, are first century hymns written by gospel sing, songwriters in the first century. It was new music. That's like one time a man said to me, I don't like this new music in the church. I said, are you aware that most of the, the songs we have in our hymnal started in the 1600s? And so I would say around 1600, that was new music. And also he says spiritual songs. Do you know what a spiritual song is? And I've seen this on occasions. It's when a person is overcome by the Holy Spirit. And, and in the moment, the Holy Spirit gives that person the words and the melody to sing. And it's beautiful. So Paul says, sing the psalms, sing the hymns, and sing the spiritual songs. Look at the diversity of music that's there. What happened to me when, when I became a Christian was I found out that in the church and singing in the church is not about how I sing, it's about why I sing. If you're worried about how you sing, you probably are just going to hold a hymnal. Growing up in a church, I grew up in a church about this size, and I don't remember as, as, as a youth, as a young person, ever taking the hymnal and singing. I remember at least two weeks out before I accepted Christ as my Savior, I was standing by a man named Mr. Herbert Rushton, and we, we stood up to sing, and he handed me half of the hymnal, and I held it, and I never sang one word. But that week at FCA camp in Black Mountain, North Carolina, I got saved and filled with God's Spirit, and I've been singing ever since. I believe if Satan comes to a door of a church and he hears the voices inside that church raising the roof, singing praises and honor to God, encouraging each other, inspiring each other, bonding with each other in song, I think he'll close the door and go down the road. But I think if Satan opens the door of the church and most of the voices are silent, most of the people aren't singing, I think he'll stay a while. I think he'll stay a while. The author of the article I was reading, he says, I don't think the problem why there's a decline in congregational singing has to do with choice of music. He says, because singing in the, in the church is about the heart. He says, what I think is happening is it's not in the heart, and when it's not in the heart, it won't be in the voice. So if we want to be filled with music in the church, we need people filled with the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to close with this. In all my ministry, there's only been two books that I, that I am deeply concerned about in the church, and that's the Bible and the hymnal. I have always, as a minister, wanted to preach the Word of God, and I always have wanted to sing with my brothers and sisters to lift up the roof to praise God because I believe if a church has good preaching and good singing the gates of hell can't stop them but if they got terrible preaching and terrible music Satan's going to hang around for a while going to hang around for a while I need to close this is that okay this morning because I need to let you sing since I'm talking on it good being with you and I hope that I in some way have helped you in your walk of faith and I have inspired you I hope that you understand from my preaching how important the Word of God is and how relevant it is and how it speaks to every generation. How it speaks to every generation. Let us pray. Christian God, we do thank you for this morning. We thank you for our time together, and I thank you for these good people. And I thank you for your spirit that, that lives within these folks. We thank you for Griff and Rachel and, and Theo. We thank you for their life and for the ministry they have within your church and we ask you to always bless them and be with them and i pray god that you will truly send send the revival in this church that each and every one of us will understand the importance 
of being filled with the right stuff. Something happens to a church when every member is filled with the right stuff with the Spirit of God. We also thank you for the prayer that you gave us to pray, say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins trances, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. All right, and now I invite you all to stand along with me as we join together in our closing hymn, Sweet, Sweet Spirit. today let us join together in our sending him sending prayer <laughs> father give us grace to live this week to the full being true to your word in every way and jesus help us to give ourselves away in service to others and for your gospel spirit send us out into the world to love the lost proclaiming christ in all that we do and say amen Go in peace.